time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey everybody and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here and this is our Merry Christmas bonus, Merry Christmas to everyone episode where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens and eggnog. Yay! <laughs> we drink a ton. I'm talking a ton of coffee. And eggnog. And eggnog too. But most importantly, we hug our chickens every day and then we drink more eggnog. Don't forget to hug your chicken before the eggnog and after. <laughs> <laughs> we brew coffee from a local coffee house here in Bel Air, Maryland, Coffee Coffee. Holly Ann, what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Frosty's favorite. Tastes yes. amazing, smells amazing. And if you're local, go over and get a cup of coffee. They have scones, they have everything. You won't be disappointed. So, here we are. It's Christmas week. Christmas week. And December 22nd is a special day. Is it? <laughs> it's your birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Holly Ann. Happy birthday to you. Did, did. Had to get that out there. Thank you. I'm 30. I'm 35 today. I'm 34. How are you 35? I'm 34 today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, so this is an awesome thing to do on a birthday. We did it on my birthday, too. Yeah, that's right. We did. It was a lot of fun. It's always fun. Mm -hmm. we, love, we love just sitting and chatting it up, drinking coffee. just want to take a moment to talk with everyone about a, a farm called Iowa Blue Farm. It's a woman-owned, family-run, all-natural chicken treat company, and it's in the Midwest. And we love supporting those woman-owned businesses. We, we really, really do. They grow all-American oven-dried black soldier fly larvae for all different types of poultry, for ducks, for turkeys, for chickens, any kind of poultry that you have. And the most important thing is, I don't know about you, but I have a late molter this year. I do too. Lucy, she is losing a lot of feathers. Th these treats, these grubs have a lot of protein, a lot of calcium, which are really vital this time of the year. Yeah, they're an excellent concentrated source of protein and calcium. My honeysuckle is a late molter. Sometimes she feels so miserable she stops eating, um, but she loves these grub treats so much that she runs when she sees that blue bag. They see the blue bag, and we all know chickens see color, so they know the blue bag mm -hmm. is Iowa Blue Farms. And I, I can tell you my chickens are, they go crazier for these. So if you haven't tried them yet and you'd like to give them a try, iowabluefarm.com. We have the link in our show notes and the shipping is always, always free. Always free. So please, if you have a second, check them out. Now we're ready to move on. To our breed spotlight. spotlight. Da, 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 da. You are better than a soundboard, I tell you. <laughs> it's my favorite part. I don't need sound part. effects, I have you. It's my very favorite part. So in honor of Christmas, 12 days of Christmas and all that, we're going to talk about French hens. Da -da. So, <laughs> so I was doing a little digging, um, you know, the English song, the 12 days of Christmas. Oh, Your yeah. Your true love gave you three French hens, which I don't know about you, but that person sounds like a keeper to me. Three French hens. That's the best. I'm not going to turn that down. Hey, I have two French hens. Uh, do I have any? I don't think I have any French hens. My yeah. true love needs to get on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> hey, get her some French hens. <laughs> okay, anyway, so um, as I dug, it looked like historians of livestock and like music and culture historians, they tend to think that this was an old French breed called the Bresse Goloise. Wow. Yes. That's a, that's a long it's a, name there. It's a mouthful. It is. It's a very old breed. There were evidence of them as early as the 1500s. Okay. And they were, like a lot of early breeds, they were named for the geographical region where they developed. Yes. And they they had to be called that from what I understand, too. Like, they were like, they're going to be called. Wrestling. Yeah. The French government passed laws that dictates that only chickens that were produced within the boundaries of historical breasts could be called breasts. Exactly. Sort of like sparkling wine from champagne is the only real champagne. Yeah, exactly. And so all other birds of this breed that were bred outside of the area of breasts are called galoisa. And a lot of people do put the breasts in front of it. Right, right. So just to keep things simple, we're just going to talk about breasts. And the thing that's very interesting about the whole breast thing is that it's not even called breasts anymore. The area is not called breasts anymore, it's, right? It's the Rhone Alps region. Right, right. So it 
it's changed names, but the chicken has not. The chicken has not changed. They're considered a dual purpose bird. They're very good layers of large white eggs. They are, and they have large white earlobes also. They do. They're handsome chickens with a big single comb and waddles and blue legs and feet. That sounds really cool. And to me, they kind of remind me of the Mediterranean breeds, although they don't stand straight up. Right. The, so they have the white egg and they have the white earlobe, so they're similar, but their body is more low and long. Right. And there's a blue variety of breasts that looks a lot like the heritage breed Andalusian chickens. That's cool. I feel like we really need to give them a little French beret that's knit. <laughs> <laughs> that would set it off. That would be perfect. That would be an awesome picture. And when you look them up, basically what comes up first is the white. But there yes. are some other colors. There's right. the white, the blue, the gray, the black. But the white is their traditional breast color. Right, that was color. the traditional breast color. And there's another variety. It's, it's a different breed, but similar name. It's called the Golden Galwaza. And it's supposed to be the oldest breed of farm chicken in France. That's really neat. There's a likeness of this bird that's used as the emblem of France a lot. That's cool. Yeah. And the hens look a lot like your Gertie. The mystery chicken. The mystery chicken. It was supposed to be an olive acre. No green eggs. <laughs> and then we thought brown leghorn. Right. Because nope. her, she had a little bit of white on her ear list, but not nearly enough. And then, so no white eggs. No white eggs. And then we said welsomer. And she laid a light brown egg. She looks the most like a well summer again. But we know she's not a golden Kalwaza because she, she might be. She doesn't lay a white egg though. Oh yeah, you're right. So oh. um, Gertie remains a mystery. She's been like French royalty. <laughs> <laughs> so this really old chicken, like a lot of heritage breeds, had almost disappeared from France by the nineteen hundreds. Wow. But conservation has stepped in to keep the breed alive. There is a Brest Galoisa Club of France that was founded in 1904. And it's still out there now? Still out there now. So they work to conserve and develop the breed. So if you have an interest in this, that would be something to look up. Yeah, they have a website. The link's in our show notes. You can take a look and learn something about them. That would, yeah, definitely. There are American breast chickens that are available in the U.S., but you really have to search. You really do have to, that's what we were finding, that you have to really search around and you can get some hatching eggs. Yes. The other thing is to check with Greenfire Farms to see if there are any chicks available there. Yeah, they definitely sold chicks for the American breast in the past. And the other thing is, with the braid, they need a little scarf to go with them. Oh, for heaven's sake. But I think they would be adorable. And I, is it just the breasts that get the braid and the scarf? They're or French. is it any French Or could hen? it be my cuckoo Morans out there have to get that too? I oh, mean, I could see I could see Drusilla in a beret very easily. <laughs> Kicking some butt. I will say this. The French chickens do have strong personalities with the other chickens. That's the Morans why my two do. are named Drusilla and Anastasia from the Stepsisters of Cinderella. So, before we get to cracking the eggs, we have a little surprise for you. We do. We have a big surprise. We had the pleasure of sitting down with Katie Richards of Drinking with Chickens. And we got to speak with her for a little while, and we had a great time. So what we want to do is bring you that interview now and enjoy. We're here with Katie Richards today, and we want to, she is the author of Drinking with Chickens. So we are so honored to have you on our podcast and to be able to talk with you for a little while. Thank and you for having me. <laughs> yes, definitely. You're basically one of the first people we thought of that we wanted to get an interview with. We're like, Katie Richards. <laughs> That's so sweet. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Oh, yeah. We wish we could be in LA with you. <laughs> it's leading here this morning. <laughs> Oh, God. oh, it's terrible weather. The chickens are not happy. No one's happy. We're in mid Atlantic. Sure. We're in Maryland. And they're calling for, what, 6 to 12 on Wednesday. Snow. 6 to 12 inches of snow, yeah. Yeah. Good time. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Yeah. I won't tell you what it looks like outside here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Your gardens are beautiful. Right now. <laughs> you know that. Um, a lot of this episode is about the possible breed that could be the three French hens in the 12 Days of Christmas song. So our first question for you is... Your true love gifts you three French hens. What <laughs> breeds would they be? Literally any breed, as long as it's a chicken. <laughs> we agree. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not actually familiar with that um, breed of chicken. So I was kind of like investigating a little bit when you guys had mentioned that. But yeah, I don't have any of those. So 
<laughs> who knows? <laughs> yeah, the Cuckoo Moran would be a good one. Cuckoo Moran, I is that two. yours? Would that be yours, your French hen, Chris, Cuckoo Moran? That would be my French hen. Yeah, okay. definitely. I think mine would be um, Simon Favreau's. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that. Oh. My two are named after the Cinderella stepsister, so that can only tell you. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you have any favorite breeds, French or not? I am very partial to the Polish chickens. I've had a couple of those, and they are just so charming and silly and derpy. That's that's what I always say about them. <laughs> and then I've also become really partial to the de clays. I can't say it. The Belgian duckles. De clays. <laughs> I like to say duckle. That's completely wrong. <laughs> and is Spork a duckle? Yes, she is. Okay. Oh yes. my god. So now and and we have a new one, Parsnip. One of one of our babies is oh, is wow. one too. I love that name. Parsnip. Okay, this is <laughs> And the little one, she is adorable in that hat. Mm -hmm. walk, oh my goodness. Christy's kind of mad about <laughs> knitted chicken hats. Oh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chickens love hats. No, no, they do not. <laughs> no, they don't, but we do. Yeah. So we just wanted to say, again, that your book is amazing. And the photography is just this amazing blend of gorgeous and hilarious Things like the, the chicken claw coming in for a drink. So we're wondering which of your chickens is most difficult to photograph? Which ones do you think, is there a breed, you know, specific that doesn't want to stay still for you? Or are they just kind of, you know? I, I don't know if it's a breed thing or if it's just, you know, specific chickens just happen to have the right personality slash tolerance for my shenanigans. I have... Like, for instance, I have two Easter eggers that one of them is very good and will just sit in place. She shows up in the book quite a bit. And the other one is feral, just completely feral. <laughs> and I don't think, I don't even know if she's really even shown up in any photo, at least by herself, where it wasn't like a group shot of, you know, the chickens in the yard. Because she's just wants nothing to do with being touched, being held, being placed in a photo. <laughs> So that's, you know, a breed, you know, it's the mutt breed, but there's two chickens that are, could not be more different personality wise, you know, as far yeah, as taking just, photos. So. Any tips that you could give us to keep them still for that nanosecond <laughs> to try to get it? I think at this point, the ones that I have that are like very agreeable to doing these photo shoots have sort of, I don't want to say I've trained my chickens because that's giving me too much credit <laughs> it's but it's sort of like you you buy their their compliance with treats and so they've kind of learned at this point that if they kind of put up with standing in place for a moment they get treats they get they get treats for being okay. you know patient with me so <laughs> yeah, we have, I have a certain few that are my go-to that if there's a sunset picture I want or something a good picture I'm gonna right. pull buttercup out and she's gonna be my model you know so right. And then there's right. the other ones that you're like, no way. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. No, no. That's I, I have I have a handful, and, and again, we just we added to our flock a few months ago, and so the, the new batch. There's actually quite a few in there that have been really agreeable so far, and I'm like, oh, so much promise, so much promise in this new group. <laughs> so how many um, do you have now? I don't like to say the number. <laughs> I, get, I get jinxy about the number because we probably have a few more than we should in our set up but we also you know the nature of having chickens is that you have the older ones that it seems like every time i put the number out there i lose one so i'm very yeah, yes. about it. we understand um, completely but you know i have i have a few that are you know pushing nine years old now wow. and then this oh, wow. new batch and yeah. so i have found that sort of the the natural rhythm of chicken keeping is that you you lose a few and then you get a few more and the number's always changing <laughs> Right. It's it, true. It always kind of it's chicken math as everybody says it's yeah. like you never give that solid number so right right i totally agree with <laughs> so back to your book moderately sized backyard flock that's what i have <laughs> don't we all <laughs> yeah i gotta tell my husband that we all have um, what's the one must make recipe in your book oh gosh well Clearly, I am a Mai Tai fan, um, and there's one in every season. The book is broken into seasons, and so I managed to stick one of those in, in each season. But um, 
I kind of am partial to the Mai Tais and I really love the cutting garden Mai Tai, which is a spring recipe. Okay. Um, nice. I'm also very partial to like floral cocktails that have a little floral bent to them. And so those show up quite a bit in the book too. Okay. <laughs> so if someone is starting a cocktail garden, what are the top three plants that you recommend? I like that one. That's a good question. Herbs, a hundred percent herbs. It, it's, those are the, the most basic, usually pretty easy to grow mm -hmm. ingredient. Even if you are, you know, growing on a kitchen window. So that's, that's the easiest thing to grow yourself, to be able to have fresh to put into cocktails. So which is your, um, what's that? Which is your favorite herb then? Um, it's really not that exciting, but mint. But the reason why is oh, that yeah. um, there's so many different variations of mints. And that's what I sort of obsess over is having all of the different like flavored mints and flowering mints are one of my favorite things to um, garnish with. I like to garnish with flowers too, obviously. <laughs> and this year, I don't know if you had it, but we found, I grew berries and cream mint, which was I had that. I did so that good. Yeah. And yeah. chocolate and pineapple mint. I grew like pineapple. maybe five or six different mints because I was addicted to the flavors. Yeah. It's so crazy. It's so crazy. The different varieties that there are now. And I, yeah, I get really overly excited about the different mints. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from that, I love lavender. I use lavender a lot in cocktails. I love rosemary a lot. Rosemary grows as a perennial here. And so I have it all year long. Oh, lucky. Um, and then I also tend to grow a lot of edible flowers. Again, that's um, if you have the space to grow the flowers, it's not necessarily like an easy windowsill garden to do. But if you can grow some edible flowers, that's another high on my list of, you know, garnish slash additions to cocktails. That's and so then of course, citrus. If you can do citrus, citrus is cornerstone of almost every cocktail. So my yeah. first year, I have a lemon tree and I have nice. one lemon on there <laughs> and I'm watching it. It's like a little baby. I'm like, grow, grow. <laughs> yeah. It, it always takes a little bit of time to <laughs> add oh citrus God. to your garden, but I moved it to the perfect bay window. I'm like, okay, it's not too nice. strong of light. It's a perfect light grow nice. like giving it its vibes so that's yeah. like what we want to get into more is the gardening versus yes. like mm -hmm. to add in with the chickens but and who doesn't want to drink i mean <laughs> Kate, what will you be drinking over the holidays <laughs> oh eggnog eggnog is my thing Egg you know? okay. we've been drinking it so much lately that joe my husband had to put together my nephew's little atv that we're giving him last night and he's like you know you've got to go make me that eggnog. It's a brandy <laughs> knock. <laughs> I know. It's just, I mean, and especially when you have the, the fresh eggs straight from your chickens, it's like the best. It's the best. And and again, I like to tell the story of how I used to hate it growing up. Me too. Um, but that's because I only ever had the store-bought stuff, and it's just two completely different beasts, you know? And so once once you've had the, the fresh homemade it's just, they're not even in the same realm, you know? Do you do anything special with your eggs? I mean, are you using like super fresh or do you refrigerate them first? Yeah, I tend to, I don't always refrigerate my eggs, but yeah, with the putting raw eggs into cocktails, especially, I am overly cautious about it. And yeah, you want to make sure that they're super clean eggs. You want to make sure that, yes, they've been refrigerated. They're newly laid. I, yeah. You just want to take all of the precautions and okay. then of course just be cognizant of how it smells and looks. And if anything's off about it, don't use it. If there's any question, don't use it. Don't yeah. Use it. No. Get another egg tomorrow. Right. <laughs> so yeah. you're like, okay, let's check this out. <laughs> yeah. So what I wanted to check with you is about your barware. I absolutely love, we both are to die for vintage chickens. So like I found these at a little thrift store, the Roly Polies. I'm in love with 50s and 60s barware. So me too. <laughs> so how did you come about? Like, did you just find it like treasure hunting and then kind of took to it, or? Um, yeah, you know what? It's interesting. I think my love of vintage barware came from my dad's parents, who always had. Uh, the most amazing barware and just glassware and china and all this. They just had, you know, these like beautiful buffets or display cases just full of these 
for this glassware, you know, Mm -hmm. and I have some of it. And for whatever reason, I just, as a kid was really fixated on it. You know, in retrospect, it was like very foretelling (laughs) of what was to come, but yeah, I hung on to some of that. So for a long, for most of my life, I've had this really cool vintage barware from my grandparents and it just kind of stuck with me. And I started, you know, collecting more because I kind of wanted to have that display case full of beautiful glassware. Did most, and, of it have, uh, um, did most of it have gilding on it of some sort? A, a lot of it does. Yeah. Yeah. Um, your, I your tend to. glasses in the book are to die for. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, they are amazing. Are they the ones that I sell or the, the I ones from remember? They're in the book <laughs> themselves. Okay. So, so they're probably I ones that the, own. You probably own them. I wouldn't expect you to sell these. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, is the gold ones. Yeah. Those were probably my grandparents, actually. I think I used the gold ones for my grandparents. But yeah, so it just kind of is something, this weird little thing from childhood, weirdly, that I was obsessed with barware as a kid. (laughs) Normal. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's like, it's like what we were saying and the other in one of our other episodes time repeats itself and basically we're just seeing a repeat of you know what was old is new again Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it's just amazing like my table is set with um the old curiosity shop which is a print from like in the 50s for christmas yeah Yeah, it is so you know it's nice we were having a big laugh the other day because we were teenagers in the 1980s and (laughs) You're seeing vintage 80s things pop up in the shops and on eBay now. Yeah. Vintage. Vintage. We're yeah. vintage. Huh? vintage. I know. <laughs> crazy. It's crazy. Do you, collect yeah, but- any, do you collect any other vintage chicken stuff besides the barware? I wouldn't specifically say there's any things that I look for other than chicken things that sort of make me laugh and that's really what i what i go for is i I like to decorate with things that give me a little bit of joy and give me a chuckle you know and a lot of the chicken stuff especially the vintage chicken stuff is just like so good for that you know Um, (laughs) and that's why that's the other crazy thing is that you know when i started sort of really getting into this whole thing vintage barware I started getting a little more aggressive about collecting it because it becomes props for what I do for a living, you know? And then all of a sudden I realized there is this whole world of vintage chicken barware that exists. It was a whole thing in the fifties and sixties and forties even. And if you are really looking, it's everywhere. It's crazy Mm -hmm. how much there is. And again, it just makes me laugh, you know, like it's so joyful. Yes. It, it makes um, sense because in the 50s, there was a resurge of right. household backyard chicken keeping. So 100%, of yeah. course, everyone had chickens in their backyard and they wanted it to represent and what they were eating and drinking on. So it's all coming back around. Yeah. And yeah. it's so funny because I'll have my parents over and they'll be like, oh my God, I think I still have something in the attic with them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I want that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> okay, Kate, this is the question we are dying to ask you. Do you ever buy booze because there's a chicken on the label? All the time. All the time. <laughs> Just it's it's like a done deal if there's a chicken on the label. So we're yeah. not the only ones. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, I'm I'm a total glutton for that. <laughs> <laughs> any wine, anything that has a chicken on the label, that's where I am. Yeah. So yeah. here's one that I participated in actually this spring is <laughs> National hashtag national drink with your chickens day. <laughs> I sat on my deck, held one of my lavender babies, the pullets, and was drink it away. So how did how did you come up with this? And you know, it's a good way to bring the chicken community together, that's for sure. Well, yeah, the the entire quote unquote brand that I'm going for right now is really to me, it's a it's a social thing. And so it just at some point I realized that you could actually register these national these ridiculous national days you know (laughs) and I was like this is a good this is this is a moment to be social with this whole brand you know and 
at the same time, it's kind of a marketing device as well. You know, it's it's like pe people love a ridiculous national day, you know, yeah. and this is one that is actually, you know, before COVID, it had this social aspect to it. So mm -hmm. it was an excuse for people to get together and have a happy hour party with their chickens. Right. And I and love that. The hashtag. <laughs> That's what I want Everyone people to be doing. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> So, I mean, I so guess. yeah, that's, that's, I just thought it would be, it's completely silly, but it, I thought it would be fun. Oh, yeah. You know? I mean, and I enjoyed going on like Instagram and looking at all the pictures of everybody <laughs> and their different personalities coming out in the pictures of how they're going to pursue, put themselves out there just drinking with their chickens. Right, right. So, their favorite glass or where they are in their favorite spot. So it really does. And that's one thing that we love about the chicken community. It brought them together even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so it was a really good thing. Really, really good thing. We wanted to ask you if you have any up and coming projects that you might want to give us a little sneak peek into. There's a couple that basically were put on the back burner because of COVID. I'm not sure if we're, we'll see what 2021 rings we were supposed to start filming a project but that got stopped because of everything so without giving too much away yes maybe there are a few things <laughs> early on in 2021 if we like things that. are kind of getting back to normal i looking ahead i would love to do another book i would love to continue doing calendars i thought that was just a lot of fun and you know we'll we'll see we'll see that what, was the what other thing that we wanted to talk about was your calendar and that it was a labor of love. And from what I, what I read, it took you two years. It took darn near as long as the book. It's, it's crazy how long it takes. I mean, the book took two years too. They, they came about at the exact same time. And yeah, it's a lot of work, a lot of time. And then they both came out at the beginning of the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> but it's... I feel like it was a good way to get together. So, you know, like we, we had the book and then I bought it for Holly Ann because mm -hmm. she babysat her goddaughter chicken for me for a week. And I'm like, you're going to need this. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, most of that, I have celiac disease, so no gluten or dairy for me. Gotcha, but gotcha. I found that your recipes are really easy to convert. We did the brandy, we the brandy converted nog, the brandy nog, and we just yeah. did soy milk and oat creamer instead of the cream and milk. It was perfect. Awesome. Good yeah, so definitely easy to make your own, which is one thing that we like to do a mm -hmm. little bit. So, yeah. but, and it's so pretty to look at. Sometimes I'll just sit in the chair and the girls are like, are you looking at your book again? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have two daughters. Oh, I'm awesome. alone with her drinks. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> so we saw that you have another eggnog recipe on your website. The pistachio nog. Yeah, just came out this week. Which looks fabulous. Which we're Is trying. It, yeah, we will definitely be making that one. Is there any other advice, anything else you want to tell us about eggnog before we let you go? No, other than, you know, my whole thing is obviously filling it with booze, which, you know, makes it safer to drink as far as the raw ingredients mm -hmm. as well, theoretically. In fact, that's that was how eggnog even came about is that it used to be a way of preserving the dairy and the eggs was to put alcohol in it, you know? Right. So that's what I sort of really lean into, obviously, is the boozy eggnog. Um, you can do it without the booze, but <laughs> I recommend the booze. That's that's my that's thing. That's what we you know, say. But I know not everyone can drink the booze, you know, but yes. boozy eggnog <laughs> That's, it's very important to me. <laughs> the girls wanted to know what I was making the other day. They were like, why can't we drink this? I'm like, this is a grown-up drink. You cannot drink this eggnog. This really, eggnog. really a grown-up drink. <laughs> Even when they're grown-ups. No, there's not enough here. No, yeah. you're getting any. <laughs> not at all. Well, should we wrap this up sure. a little bit? We wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much for oh, accepting my pleasure. our invite to have an interview with us. And I'm sure everyone's going to love to hear from you. <laughs> so once again, thank you. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Great. And, and cheers. <laughs> All right. Happy holidays. Kate. Happy Thanks holidays. again. Bye. Bye. We just want to say thank you to Kate again for that interview. It we had so much, pleasure. she was so much fun. I laughed myself silly. <laughs> so now we're getting on to cracking, cracking the, the eggs. eggs. And Cr as you may have figured out by now, we're going to talk about eggnog. 
Yeah, there's so many things that we can say about eggnog. And the first is looking through the Drinking with Chicken books, those recipes for eggnog in there are delicious. They're delicious. They were really easy for us to convert to dairy free for me because I can't have the dairy. And gluten free. Right. Which is kind of naturally gluten free, I guess. Yeah, most of the drinks are. Uh -huh. Yeah, but dairy free for you. And we made both versions and we drank both versions. <laughs> well, I, I Right, I didn't drink the dairy one. So eggnog, it likely developed somewhere in medieval Europe. There are records of monks in England making punch with eggs. And somewhere along the line, that evolved into nog. Hey, it, you can't get better than eggnog, <laughs> especially at Christmas time. And in England, it was more of a drink for the wealthy people because those ingredients tended to be expensive. And they're rich. So you're using, okay, so for the non-dairy, you're, you're using an, um, a soy milk uh -huh. and an oat brand we used an oat brand um the oat creamer yeah oat creamer. it's very thick and creamy for the dairy you're using whole milk and heavy cream right uh, so a thick cream um sugar eggs and the alcohol would have been quite pricey exactly and then like kate was saying in the interview the alcohol that it's put in is basically put into conserve because you're using raw eggs and right eggnog and to keep them fresh in in the drink so that kind of is a dual right. purpose. It tastes good and it helps the eggs. And you always want to use eggs that you know are super fresh, that you try to make sure you, they don't float, make sure they're good, wash them really well. So when you're making eggnog, you can pasteurize the eggs yourself. You can buy pasteurized eggs. You can pasteurize them yourself by heating them gently on the stove. And you want to keep all the components refrigerated. Refrigerate the egg whites. Make sure everything's chilled. It needs to be 40 degrees or below because that's the temperature at which most bacteria stop growing. That is very good to know. There are hundreds of eggnog recipes available. It was pretty common in early America. And alcohol, eggs, cream, and sugar were easier to come by and not quite as expensive. Right. And I think we talked once before about the Maryland eggnog. It traditionally had brandy, rum, and rye because who just wants one whiskey? Exactly. You can have three. I mean, that's a lot. Of, that's, <laughs> that's a lot, lot in one drink right there. As well as the eggs, dairy, sugar, and nutmeg. I mean, that sounds like a vacation in a cup right there. It really does. So we made the Clementine brandy eggnog recipe from Kate's book. Correct. And did we have fun making it or what? It was a lot of fun. It wasn't super hard. No, it was it was fairly easy. And then once we made it and then I made the dairy, now Joe, that's all he wants. Oh, it was delicious. Is it was for delicious. Me to keep making the eggnog every day. <laughs> <laughs> you need to double or triple the recipe. Because like you were saying, the alcohol helps preserve exactly. all the ingredients. You do still want to keep it in the refrigerator. Oh yeah. You definitely have to make it and put it in something and seal it and put it in the fridge. Yeah. But it can last days and days. And then every day if you want the egg whites on top, you just take egg fresh egg whites and beat them and beat until them. they're the peaks are stiff, and then you can add that to it that way. By day three, I felt like it was a boozy cream sickle in my <laughs> glass. It was so delicious. It was very good. So, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of ways that you can, as this with our crack in the eggs, you can make this your own. Yes. You can use Kate's recipe from her book, or and you can even switch up little things. Sure. Like for you, you can't have dairy, so we made it dairy-free. and. I had both versions. They tasted the same to me. I think if you didn't want to use the soy milk, you could probably use a nut milk, but that oat creamer is so thick. Yeah. It's really an excellent replacement for, for cream. As long as you don't need to whip the cream, it's right. an excellent replacement. And in that recipe, you're not whipping Exactly. It. You're whipping the egg whites. Right. So this, it was a perfect thing. And who does not want a glass of eggnog this time of the year? It's a revelation to someone who has only ever had an eggnog out of a carton. Very, very different. Yeah. Very different. And once you make your own, you will never, ever go back. So shall we talk a little bit more? Our retail therapy, we're just going to go right into. We're going to talk about Kate's book. Oh, yeah. And Drinking with Chickens. That book is. The photography really is beautiful. And the chickens in there. I love talking to her about how she does taking the pictures right. with the chickens and how they cooperate. Because as chicken owners... That's what we love to do is sit out with your chickens and take pictures and hang with them and <laughs> take your drinks out with them. I mean, let's be honest here. Have we all taken a drink, whether it's coffee or an alcoholic beverage, and a camera out with our chickens? 
Yes. And and then just sit there, drink, and then when you think they're doing something cute, you're like, Shh, yeah, I got that picture, I got this, I got that. So this book is like, it gives you four seasons. Right. Um, where, you know, you can take whatever season you're in with, which those things are kind of in season to get. And we've had a lot of fun looking through all of them and drinking all of them. I love the pictures. I just love to look through the photos, see all the chickens, see all the plants. And as Kate mentioned in her interview, growing herbs is fantastic if you're trying to make a cocktail garden. Oh, yeah. A lot of those herbs are also good for your chickens in various ways. Which we're going to talk about Uh in an upcoming episode. So... It kind of all goes together. It does. And as actually, as a semi-professional baker, I will tell you that I use a lot of herbs and edible flowers to decorate my cakes. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's an awesome thing to get into. And if you have the space for the edible flowers, they're great to have. Nasturtiums are one of my absolute... And Kate does um, do some recipes with nasturtiums in the book. Um, they're one of my favorite things for decorating cakes and cupcakes. And my chickens go insane over the nasturtium greens. The, the other thing that we can mention is she was telling us that when we were asking her about our favorite drink, that usually for each season she has a Mai Tai. Uh-huh. So it was so weird because that's the drink we chose right. to drink when we were speaking with her, the cranberry Mai Tai. And let me say, it was very easy to make and it was delicious. It was delicious. And it was really, really pretty. We're going to put a picture up on our Instagram we had them ready to go waiting for to come on the zoom so it's just a pretty drink it was light it was good she has a mai tai for each season and i love that this book is divided into seasons that the plants that she uses in the cocktails are seasonal and we that's what we've been trying to do right that's what we're going to continue to do yes it is go through the seasons and kind of make different drinks for the season so now that we're in winter we said too that we're going to try the whiskey uh the coffee right that's one we still need to make that looks amazing so the other thing that kate has done is she's done a calendar yes and she was telling us in the interview that both have taken her their labor of love and they've taken her multiple years to do so the calendar is a beautiful calendar the thing that we want to let everybody know is if you try to purchase this on amazon there is someone who copied her calendar and is not her so if you go on there and you want to see it and and purchase it the one with the stripes it's a little bit it's a few more dollars you'll see the difference right is her and we made it easy Uh, we have a link straight to her calendar on amazon if you're interested in buying one get it quickly because they're selling out they are and if you can the books this day and age we're saying everybody try to do some shopping local right so our town of Bel Air has multiple little bookshops that are down in there, and she's in a lot of different bookshops. If you can't find them in your local bookshop or you're just having trouble, you can go to Amazon, and we will have a link directly in our show notes that will take you right to her book. Yes, we will. But if you can find it locally, that's that's something that's near and dear to her heart, sure. and she would like you to purchase it that way also. So those two things are out there. We had a great afternoon speaking with Kate. I can't wait till we can talk to her again. <laughs> it was so much fun. It was a lot of fun. And I loved kind of, you know, getting her input on the drinks and different things and her gardens and everything else. So if you're interested in craft cocktails and chickens, that's the book it's for you. Kate's a wonderful person to support. She's a woman-owned business. She's an independent artisan. And she loves chickens. And she does a lot of work with rescues and different things. Yeah, that's fabulous. So we love that about her also. So So, again, check out our show notes. We have links to everything there. Definitely. So should we say goodbye to everybody? Yes, we shall. Should we tell you, hug your chicken every day. And drink some eggnog. And merry, merry, merry Christmas to everyone. And we're hoping that you enjoy this bonus Merry Christmas episode and happy birthday to Holly Ann episode. (laughs) Thank you. So until next time, hug your chicken every day. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye-bye. If you'd like to see more from us, follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. To send us comments, feedback, suggestion, or questions, email us directly, Chrissy and Holly at coffeewiththechickenladies.com. Thanks for listening. Ha, 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 ha.